Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, February 14, 1935, a special committee in the House of Representatives was preparing a report on developments that had taken place over the previous couple years. Their report on those developments read in part, and here's the quote, We have received evidence that certain persons had made an attempt to establish a fascist organization in this country. There is no question that these attempts were discussed, were planned, and might have been placed in execution when and if the financial backers deemed it expedient. So, uh, listeners, happy Valentine's Day. We're talking about a possible fascist coup in uh, the early 1930s. And here to discuss, as always, is Nicole Hammer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. It's my favorite Valentine's present, a fascist exactly. coup. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and Kelly and Kelly Carter-Jackson of Wellesley is here as well. Hello, Kelly. Hey there. Uh, there's a lot to unwind here about this possible coup plot against Roosevelt, but... Um, you know, I think we should start with a little bit of the background because it feels like there's two big forces, Nikki, that are kind of leading to this moment. And then we'll discuss the moment. But there's two key groups. One is veterans who are grumpy and then let's call them financiers or Wall Street types who are also growing pretty upset with Roosevelt. So, you know, lay out the anger between those two groups and then we'll talk about how they come together in this in this plot. Yeah, I think we should take a one step back and talk about the bigger context, which is that the U.S. economy had collapsed, mm-hmm. um, that in 1929, the economy begins to bottom out. And these veterans were upset and marched on Washington and encamped there because they had been promised bonuses for their service in World War One. <laughs> Instead of waiting, they were like, actually, we can't eat now. So please give us our bonuses now. And Hoover refused. So here you had a bunch of veterans who were really upset, who really needed their money, who believed that they were entitled to it. And then you had a very separate group, which is Wall Street financiers who were pretty concerned that Roosevelt coming into office was going to damage their interests. And of course he was, right? For, I mean, he was helping them in some ways by stabilizing the banks and stabilizing the entire financial industry. But he was also going to do things like tax them and give their money mm-hmm. to poor people without food. And they did not like that. So they thought they could use these veterans who were really mad to overthrow the government of the United States. Yeah. So let's set aside the veterans for a moment as, you know, the looming pawn in this game, let's call it that. And and Kelly, you know, what is your sense of the real fears around Roosevelt's ascension in this moment? Well, I think part of it is that Big business is afraid that he's going to eliminate the gold standard. And so that plays a lot into their frustration with his uh, decisions that will not benefit them on Wall Street. I think there's also a moment of a lot of disillusionment. You know, the fact that veterans are upset that their government has not met their needs in the way that they felt it should be promised. So it's a huge PR blunder if you think about the fact that Hoover is removing these, you know, uh, veterans from the National Mall who are camped out. So there's a lot of anger and resentment all around. And I think. I think mm-hmm. that um, part of this is playing into this feeling of, you know, insecurity in terms of who is going to benefit in this final outcome. 
that's a really interesting reminder that I think that when you have these moments of distrust in government, you know, it's not just one group, like it does sort of pervade, right? And it's yeah. this moment of instability and the instability can play out in a lot of different ways with veterans having a legitimate grievance about the role of government in terms of having their back and then financiers also, you know, who are generally at very different ends of the spectrum um, also having their concerns. And it's this moment of real instability where it does feel like the very nature of the government itself is up in the air. I mean, you had just had this election where FDR is is brought into office, but the economic collapse is such a crisis that you have people across the United States clamoring for a dictator. They just want someone to take charge and fix the situation. They're looking across the ocean at Europe and they're seeing the rise of dictators there. And nowadays we look at that and we're like, yeah, really bad sign in the early 1930s. But for some people, it seemed like maybe this was a solution. If we have a government that can actually do something, and maybe we need a dictator in order for that to happen, mm. then Roosevelt can be this person. It's just that you also have these financiers who are like, yeah, we definitely want a dictator. That's, we're, we're in for that. Um, <laughs> it's going to work we, in our benefit. Right. <laughs> and we, we just don't want it to be a liberal New Deal Democrat. Right, right. And I think part of this, too, is that the this is really the first time that people have a general expectation of the government to work on their behalf. They believe that the government is responsible for making sure that they have food on their tables and that they they have enough to eat. And so you can see how these political and economic conditions um, can get people to want to place their trust in anyone that they think will move quickly on their behalf. Yeah, and we should just underscore what a sea change that was, because you have these Republican presidents in the 1920s whose whole philosophy was the government shouldn't do anything, mm -hmm. right? People like Calvin Coolidge, who says that the only business of the American government is business. And it takes a crisis like the Great Depression to really drive Americans into the arms of government. Yeah. Um, OK, so we've laid out, I think, the, the landscape here um, and the groups involved. But Nikki, you know, what is this this plot? So it, this is often referred to um, as the business plot um, and then sometimes referred to as the White House plot. Putsch, putsch, P-U-T-S-C-H. I don't know how to pronounce that word. So, you know, my first critique is that business plot is very boring and the other option is very hard to pronounce. They should have come up with something better. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, what is the plot here uh, as best you understand it? And then I, will, I should say before you go, we will get into whether this was actually a plot um, at all. But, you know, what do you, what is your sense? All right. My my two years of college German are going to come in handy here to oh, talk yes. about this, this White House putsch. Putsch. Um, <laughs> it is it's kind of a harebrained scheme, which might be one of the reasons why it's so easy at a certain point to dismiss. But these financiers had gotten together. They had decided that FDR was the head of a great Jewish conspiracy. And so they needed to cordon him off from power. And so they were going to use the threat of the military. They went to talk to a, a retired Marine general to have him take up this this, the head of the military coup and have them bring military force to the White House and force FDR to sort of willingly hand over power to someone who would rule in his stead. So he could stay like the figurehead president, but there would be someone else installed who would actually be making all of the decisions. And that's what their coup would look like. So when this is happening, this is insane to me, by the way, like when this is all happening and then what I don't understand is how the New York Times basically says, oh, yeah, we're, we're all on board. And then they retract and say, oh, no, actually, this is a hoax and don't believe it. What was the purpose of being all in and then reversing course? Well, that's yeah, I think that's a big part of this for me is also just the, the way in which this was treated as a hoax, a conspiracy theory, and then a real thing. You know, the mm -hmm. moment we're focused on here is this moment where the U.S. government kind of a couple years later says, oh, we thought this was for real. But in real time, it was being kind of dismissed in the media. And I think that's the heart of the question. You know, how serious of a, of a plot was this and what mm -hmm. do we make of the of the media sidelining it? 
Mm, mm. And I mean, I think if you're going to look at it that way, then it shows you that the media has the ability to legitimize these ideas or undermine these ideas based upon how they report it. So I think the way the way it can work is that if you can get the media on your side to give you sort of the fuel that you need to garner public support, then people are going to sort of, you know, give a little bit more credence to this ability for it to actually play out. Yeah, you have to decide, Kelly, whether you want to take the coup literally or seriously. (laughs) (laughs) There it is. Finally, someone makes the parallels. Uh, But yes. Um, So, you know, again, this never really comes to fruition, obviously. Um, And then what happens is there's basically one figure at the heart of this, a whistleblower. um, And, you know, for those of us, as we continue our list of great names in American history, this person's name is Smedley Darlington Butler. Um, But he was the person who was a beloved general, had been approached, um, he claims had been approached by financiers to say, basically, you know, you get 500,000 troops, we'll back you and then we'll go, uh, you know, pull this thing off. Um, He's the one who then goes to Congress, he goes to Hoover, goes to Congress, there's these hearings, and then there's this report that says it was for real. And Jody, they really had, like, raised money, they had a stockpile of weapons, they'd approach this general. So there definitely was something that was happening. Yeah. So that, I think, is, is my big question here, and I don't know if there's an answer. But, you know, for both of you, powerful people have their hands on levers all the time Mm -hmm. and they probably sit around and they talk about how they're going to use that power and which levers they're going to pull Mm -hmm. and part of that is normal and you know understood and then at some point it maybe slips over into something more sinister or whatever and so i'm just trying to you know so so my thought is like where on the that spectrum is this Mm -hmm. and in general kind of how should we just think about the fact that there are at any given moment probably very powerful people uh scheming i mean i like to think that everyone's intentions are in the right place but how how those intentions you know play out politically i think is is something to debate it's interesting though because when we look at you know smetley uh a butler he's highly decorated he won the medal of honor twice so he's beloved by military troops and really goes out in a retirement, in in a blaze, people are love him, and I think that's part of the reason that he's able to win trust and make certain decisions because he has this reputation and authority for being someone that you can put in power. Yeah, he's definitely a, a reliable narrator, seems to be. Um, and as to the question of how seriously to take this, even just in the way that we've laid it out, it doesn't quite make sense like how it was actually going to work they were going to bring the army and he was going to give up power and it just it didn't necessarily make sense but again if you looked at the examples of the beer hall putsch um, if you looked at the the brewing civil war in spain like things are the same until they change and a scheme like this may seem unbelievable and unrealistic. Um, and it probably was. But I think that it it signals something that was in the air. And certainly over the course of the 1930s, movements for fascism do take hold in the United States. The United States was not some beacon of Antifa back in the 1930s. Yeah. And so there yeah. were all of these groups. There were people like Father Coughlin on the radio who had millions of followers, who was promoting a fascistic style government. Um, there were all of these organizations that were proto-fascist or quasi-fascist. There were Nazi movements in the United States. So even if this particular conspiracy seems a little, eh, I'm not sure, it was part of of something that was happening, a ferment for fascism sure. in the mm-hmm. U.S. Mm-hmm. And I also think just in, in, in the logistics of how this could have possibly been pulled off. I mean, for one, when I read about this, I, I actually thought about what's happened in Myanmar over the last couple mm-hmm. of weeks where, you know, the, again, I'm a little out over my skis here. But, you know, my understanding there is that it's not like full on coups that completely overturn the power structure. It's more like shifting the balance between civilian leadership and military leadership. And that's kind of happened a few times over the course of decades. And this seems like it would be that, Mm -hmm. you know, it would be just kind of like, we're going to shift the center of power a little bit. We're not going to completely tear everything down. And I mean, look, we we had to all think about this stuff just earlier this year. Like these moments aren't like huge overthrows. They just sort of like change the the baseline of what's normal and then you have a new normal and you go from there. And if, you know, like if what had happened on January 6th had been quote unquote successful, 
I don't think people knew exactly what was going to come next, but it just would have like changed the path sure. of American power slightly. And who knows where we would have ended up. And so that's why I kind of like that's the part of my brain that's like gets really nervous about this stuff, because as harebrained as it seems, you also know that it's just like you start putting one foot in front of the other in this direction as opposed to this direction and you never know where you end up. And even if you think about January 6th and finding like relevancy for today, when you think about the number of veterans that were part of the storming yes. of the Campbell and this like disillusioned idea with the government or belief that the military was going to take over and that the military, I mean, there were real conspiracy theories about how the military was mm -hmm. just going to take power from Joe Biden and then there would be this new regime put in place so that they would put Trump back into power. Like people heavily bought into that and a lot of those people were veterans. Yeah, I think that's so important and I think that's why so many of the concerns in 2020 and 2021 were about the role of the military, because given our history with kind of how we tend to defer to military power, yeah, I understand why that's so crucial. So as we start to wrap up, let's bring it back to this actual moment that we're discussing here, which is again, in 1935, early 1935, there's this committee that releases this report about stuff that had happened in 1933, 1934. Uh, Nikki, what is your sense of this committee, their report, and kind of what it tells us that they basically give credence to this theory? I mean, one of the reasons I think it's it's important for historians to take this moment seriously is because this committee does investigate and then it makes its report secret, um, which is always kind of a tell that <laughs> there's something they don't want people to know. Anyway, this committee was essentially a forerunner to the House and american Activities Committee. Um, there are these committees in the 1930s that investigate fascism and communism and later on in the 30s, Nazism, as these forces that are threats to the United States. And this is one of those committees that's looking into it. It's called the um, McCormick-Dickstein Committee. And here's the here's the twist. And that is that okay. Dickstein, who was um, one of the people who was heading up the committee, was actually a communist spy. So you do have a conspiracy <laughs> here um, that is well and active even on this committee. You can understand why people were a little nervous in the 30s and beyond about conspiracies because sometimes they turned out to be true. So the interesting thing about all this is like in a lot of major U.S. <laughs> investigations, there's there's little prosecution. No one was prosecuted. No one was held accountable. They're not really able to sort of solve who all was involved in this alleged plot. And Butler says, like most committees, it slaughtered the little and allowed the big to escape. The big shots weren't even called to testify. And so in that sense, you know, you see a lot of parallels today in terms of how people are held accountable for their actions. Well, and not only were the the big shots not called to testify, the references in the report to Wall Street financiers like J.P. Morgan, DuPont, Remington Arms, those were all deleted. And so for people who were looking for a conspiracy, it, you could look at this report and be like, oh, they erased all of the names. They made the report secret. It does tend to lend some credence to yeah. people who think that, mm. you know, big interests were taking care of one another. Mm. And just to add one last little conspiracy on that front, you know, I think there is talk of the fact that Roosevelt went to a lot of people on Wall Street and basically said, look, we know this plot was true. Um, if you back off some of your opposition to the New Deal, uh, you know, maybe we'll bury this report or take your names out and, and, and so forth. And so maybe some deal was cut, um, which is relatively plausible. Um, <laughs> uh, OK, well, let's leave it there. Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, listener-supported, artist-owned podcasts. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. You can follow us on social media at This Day Pod, Twitter, and Instagram. Our website is thisdaypod.com. You can read about us there. You can get in touch with questions or comments about the show or suggestions for topics. We always appreciate those. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon.
Radiotopia. Radiotopia.